Good morning, God First, and welcome. My name is Deboho, and I am a member at God First Brown. In John chapter 4, Jesus is having quite an intense conversation with a Samaritan woman. And from verses 20 to 24, he addresses the topic of worship as she poses the great controversy between the Jews and the Samaritans on where to worship. In response, Jesus tells her that a time will come where she will no longer need to worry about where to worship. Among other things, he tells her that God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This is a truly powerful statement. In fact is, God wants us to worship him with all that we have in harmony with the facts and the revealed truth. So, this is good news for us because regardless of where we are, we can still worship and praise our King. Let's lift the name of the one who is most worthy. Rumors of the Son of Man the Stories of the Savior the Holiness with human hands No ear has heard, no eye has seen The image of the Father Till heaven came to live with me A rescue like no other Cause you are worthy You are worthy of your name Yes, you are worthy You are worthy of your name Precious Jesus You did not speak, you made no sound You died for your accusers But as your blood fell to the ground You redefined my future And on the day when
would just like to invite the Holy Spirit into your homes, into your house, with your friends and family. I just want you guys to open up your hearts and just be so one with this God. Jesus, that you are here. Sing, you are here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working in this place, I worship you. I worship you. Let's sing that again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way make miracle work, promise. 
hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's so good to be reminded that when our confidence is you in, in you, we don't have to fear the external pressures that we face, people who don't like us, difficult life circumstances, because you've got us. Our confidence in you trumps our anxiety over everything that we face. Lord, I know that we sometimes forget that. Thank you for reminding of, uh, us of that this morning. Amen. Good morning. I hope you've had a wonderful week. And if you're with us for the first time, won't you reach out to us to say hello? We'd love to connect with you and see if there's any way in which we could help you, uh, perhaps help you connect with other people who are part of our community. If you're already part of our community, why don't you reach out to someone else you know who's with us but you haven't seen for a while and say hello. This morning, we're doing our notices a little bit differently. And uh, so won't you check out this video to see what's coming up. Hey God First, we have an exciting week ahead. On Wednesday, we have the opportunity to join with our advanced family across the continent uh, in prayer. We have our first ever advanced together prayer evening. It's just an hour Wednesday evening. Uh, why not join us for an hour to pray together? Get the details on the screen or in the newsletter. On Wednesday night, we are also launching Rewire. So if in doubt, please choose Rewire. Rewire is an amazing course that's helped so many people in our church over the years. It's based on content called Redemption by Matt Chandler. And added to that, we have a small group experience where we seek to help one another to get free from some of the things that trip us up, that keep us from living the abundant life that Jesus has promised us. It will run for four weeks. It will also include a Saturday together in the garden at the church office uh, where we can pray for one another. And this is for everyone. Um, all of us have stuff in our lives that needs to be dealt with. And this course will help you. Whether it's just a stronghold area, whether it's a sin that keeps popping up you can't get rid of. Whether you're just struggling with issues of depression or even addictions. This course can really help you. So... Uh, get in touch with us at the office, info at godfirst.ca.za. Give us a call if you want to find out more. Otherwise, just uh, send us an email to sign up so that we can get you included on that course. That's Rewire Wednesday evening. Then finally, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who took the time to complete the survey. There were over 165 responses, which is just brilliant. And as a result of the info we collated there and uh, the rules governing churches at the moment. Uh, we are working towards opening up a Sunday morning service in the parks on Sunday the 1st of November. So Sunday the 1st of November we'll have our first in-person Sunday uh, meeting and the plan is to build slowly. So we're just going to start with a parks morning service at 9 a.m. We'll continue to provide excellent online content and we're hoping by then to have a few uh, more groups meeting in homes to watch the service where there's an opportunity for personal contribution, prayer and ministry. So more info on all of that to come in the weeks ahead. Obviously it'll come with the necessary social distancing and following all the rules and regulations. You'll have to book a spot. Um, but that info will come out the 1st of November is when we will look to kick this off. So in the meantime, continue to press in on the online church uh, experience. Let's keep reaching out and loving one another and serving our city. Hope you have a great Sunday. Cheers. While you're watching that video, Pula has come up and he's ready to preach to us in the second week of our series in John. Over to you, Pula. Thanks very much, Dave. Now, welcome. If you're visiting us for the first time, Dave has already mentioned, we'd love for you to get plugged into community. Um, on our website, there's a section on growth groups. This is how you can be part of um, our community. You can also email us at love to get to meet you and integrate you. This week, though, we're going to be going through um, the book of John, and we are in the second, uh, second part of the series. So we're going to be looking at John chapter 4, and verses 46 to 54. I'm going to read it for us, and then we're going to pray together, and we're going to jump right in. Here's what it says. It says, So 
he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus, was, uh, Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at a point of death. Verse 48 then continues to say, So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child die. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed, it says, the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. They said to him yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea, Judea to Galilee. We get to go through this, these verses together this morning. Um, and as I'm, I've mentioned, I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to jump right in. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that we get to look at your word together this morning as a community. We thank you that we get to look at what you do. We thank you that we get to look at what the person you're interacting with in the text does. And we thank you that this morning we also get to look at the role that we play in this uh, specific text and what it's saying to us. Thank you that you continue to shape us day in and day out of our lives. Amen. In the last couple of weeks, I have friends who have lost family members and who have lost friends and who have lost close ones. This is an incredible thing, an incredible pain to go through. Very recently, um, a friend of mine lost his father and his sibling was out of the country and couldn't get back in. I can't imagine the kind of pain that this adds to the already existing struggle of losing a loved one. You can imagine as we're looking at this text together that there is something of a struggle that this man who the Bible says and only refers to as the official goes through and we know that in moments of pain and suffering, we see more of ourselves than we had at times even ever thought was there. And so we get to look at this together this morning. We get to search through the text together this morning and see that. When we uh, look at the official in John chapter 4 verse 46, we see a man who the Bible describes uh, in this way. It says of him, He's the official. It doesn't give us his name. doesn't give us any other detail about him. It does, however, uh, allude to and give us this idea that uh, this man worked in the king's courts. And so what we see then in the Greek is we see that um, he's referred to, or the direct translation there would be basilikos. And this would mean that uh, this is some, uh, translated as a noble or a kingsman. So this official would have been Herod's, um, uh, would have been Herod's servant. He would have been working directly in Herod's court, who was king at the time, and would uh, have had great influence and power. He would have been um, a, a wealthy man as well. It says in the word that his son has not been well. In fact, the Bible says that he is close to death. This is the interaction that we see as well when this man um, is speaking to Jesus. He says, my son is going to die. So then let's see what happens. He hears that there's someone in town who can be able to help him. 
he makes his way to Jesus, his hope is that Jesus would come with him to his home, lay his hands, as we come to understand it, on his side and his son will be well. But Jesus doesn't respond in this way. Jesus only says to him, go, your son will live. And so, what I would love for us to do is I'd love for us to look at this high-ranking official together. And as we look at him, I want you to see if you can find yourself anywhere in these things that I'm going to be highlighting about him. I want you to also think about the cost that this man goes through to find himself at a place where he is. What I love about this, um, as I'm looking at this text with you, is two things that I'm reminded of recently as I'm kind of going through the text um, and, and preparing for this message. The first is this, is like Jesus is a carpenter. He is a callous hands um, kind of man um, from a small town, seemingly insignificant, um, and, and there's really nothing much to him. This official serves in the king's court. He is highly influential. We get a sense that he is a wealthy man. Um, we know and we learn much about Jesus as we look at the story together. But I, I don't think that the people who are in this scene, in this text, who are kind of looking, understand the same thing. I don't think that they get the same thing. Think of it this way. In these verses, we have someone who works for the presidency. We have someone who uh, maybe works for the sheikh if you're in the UAE. We have someone who uh, maybe works in Buckingham Palace um, for the queen if you're um, in England. Um, and this person comes out into the streets to seek for help from a guy who is poor, who is homeless, who just got out of working with his dad in the garage uh, making furniture. As I think about this, as I look at this, I realize that it doesn't matter who you are or what you have. At some point, you and I are going to need Jesus. You and I are going to need Jesus. And actually, as I make that point, I'm also realizing that if we both know that we're going to need Jesus, why don't we just cut to the chase and need him now? Why don't you just come to him now? Because you're going to need him. Uh, let's get back into the text. Um, I, I've also noticed that sometimes it's much easier to understand, to relate to, and, and even to ask for help when you have less, more so than when you have more. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a situation where you go next door to ask for sugar. I um, grew up in a small town, and, um, and actually this happened to me a lot. Go knock at the door. Mama, we said cocoa patrick. My mom says I should come ask for sugar. And and so, actually, having been in those situations, I'm realizing that um, needing is not something that, that I'm estranged to. It's not something that I'm far from. And so, asking for help and um, needing help is something that I've never really found difficult to do. Sometimes, you think of someone who doesn't have much, needing something can be easy. And even for the person themselves, it doesn't seem that far off. It doesn't seem that far-fetched. However, when people have much, it can be a little bit difficult to put themselves in a position of need. And the reason I'm bringing this to us is because I'm wanting us to just relate a little bit to the official. I'm wanting us to just get a little bit of a sense of where this official is at. It's more challenging to 
ask for help when you have than when you don't. Yet this high-ranking official has come out into the street seeking help. Another thing is that maybe you might want to ask yourself this question. When last did you ask for help? I know that in Joburg, it's easy to pass instruction to um, you know, ask for favors. It's easy to seek um, support in some ways. But actually, I don't know how many of us put ourselves or find ourselves in a position where we actually ask for help. This can be, if you have never been here, it can be a very humbling, very um, ego-attacking thing. But we see this man be in that position. This official, kind of, I can't imagine to have been a man who needed much, someone who would have had uh, to ask for anything. I don't think he asked for help often. But at this point, we realize that he has gotten to the end of himself. He here has uh, gotten to the end of his resources or his resources can help him. We, we see that his influence also can help him. And so he comes face to face with Jesus. If you haven't noticed it yet, you will notice this. You are always going to need Jesus. You're going to need Jesus. This man displays massive amounts of faith in coming to Jesus. And here's one thing that I've really appreciated about uh, this official, even as, looking at, as I look at this text. It's, he re, it requires a lot of faith for him to come to where he is. Another thing we notice here is that he leaves his bedridden dying son on his deathbed because he believes. He believes that where he's going, and the person he's going to um, come face to face with, the person he's coming to ask help from, will be able to provide it. And so he leaves his son, and he goes there. Now, parents can correct me on this, but I can't imagine that when your child is not well, you want to leave their side. I would imagine that you want to be there every single minute, seeing them recover. The only thing it would take to move from their side to go anywhere is if you knew that where you're going is going to help them get better. It's an amazing thing. And so it requires help. It requires massive amounts of faith um, for this man to, to move from where he is to Jesus. Jesus simply says to him, uh, Jesus says, go your son will live. How many of you need this kind of intervention? How many of you need this in your life? You're in a hard situation. You're in a challenging situation. You're in a stretching situation. And you just wish that Jesus, with all his power and might, would just speak life into that situation, and it would be 10. Jesus says to him, go, your son will live. Jesus sends his word. Now, I want us to quickly look at Jesus together as we're looking at these verses and see what Jesus does and how Jesus responds to this high-ranking official. Amazing thing is that Jesus doesn't do what this man asks. He doesn't do what this man wants. The expectation from the official is that Jesus would come to his house and heal his son. Jesus responds very differently to this. Jesus is not confined to space. Um, his word alone has power. Jesus' his word has power to move from where he is 
to the official's house, and Jesus basically commands healing to happen to this boy. And so we see that Jesus is omnipresent, even in his physical state, um, as he lives his life on earth. Jesus is Lord over everything. Jesus is Lord over all people. Just thinking about that and realizing that actually for the official, it didn't matter that he was a wealthy man. It didn't didn't matter that he was an influential man. It didn't matter that um, he was a powerful man. When he came face to face with Jesus, Jesus takes the throne. Jesus is Lord, and this man stands in submission. People here in this scene want what Jesus has to offer, but not Jesus himself. Now, I think that you and I stand this risk, we fall in this trap often. I don't know how often Um, this has happened to you, that you find yourself in a position where you're disappointed that your prayers are not answered. You're disappointed um, at what Jesus didn't do. Really what this means is that you have expectations of Jesus, he doesn't meet them, and you're upset about that. At times we find ourselves ready to leave Christ, we find ourselves ready to turn the other way and kind of take a different direction. We find ourselves ready to leave Christ because my expectations were not met, so I'm leaving. My side of the contract was not fulfilled, and so I'm out. Jesus, I expected you to do this. You didn't, so you can't count on me. The challenge here is that we're claiming the throne. We know the better outcome for the situation, uh, for ourselves, for the entire universe, uh, for eternity past and eternity future. And so we have a thing or two, some wisdom to share with Jesus about how we think the situation should work itself out. And so, hey, Jesus, why don't you hear me out here? Uh, Hear what I've got to say. This is a little bit what we see in this scene is that actually when Jesus deals with this man, he's dealing with him in a way that says, you need to understand that I am still Lord. You might be in need, but I know what's going on in the past, and I know what's going on in the future, and I know what you need right this very moment. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's amazing that Jesus knows what we need and when we need it. And so... Actually, we then get to um, see our relationship with Christ, and we get to ask ourselves, how are we coming to him? We get to ask ourselves, how do we relate to him? As we see ourselves, as we find ourselves exposed when we're in desperate need, when we're in moments of crisis, when we expect Jesus to do certain things, and He doesn't do them the way we're expecting. We see this of the official. He goes to Jesus. He has certain expectations. And those expectations are not met, but at least not in the way that he expects. How do we respond? This crowd in verses 46 to 50s um, is concerned about what Jesus could do for them uh, than what God is doing among them. They're concerned about what Jesus is doing for them, not what God is doing among them. You notice that when this man asks Jesus to come, I mean, you have someone who can say a word and someone in a different location gets healed, immediately the fever leaves. That, that's not the focus. The focus is, hey, I want you to perform for me. I want you to serve me. I've got this thing that I need you to do hey, why don't you just do this? So Jesus responds to what this man says. He responds to his request, but he also doesn't respond to 
to his request. Jesus only sends the word. I love how when I look at this text, I see how powerful Jesus' word is. Jesus' word is powerful. So Jesus simply sends his word. Often, we will also find that Jesus responds to our prayers, but not in the way that we expect, because he knows best, and he knows much, and much, much more than we ever could. Jesus knows much better than we ever could, and so he responds to our prayers in the best possible way. He responds to the situation in the best possible way. I love that in in this interaction, I see the official taking a massive step. And and, and as this happens, you've got to think, wow, this is exciting. This is amazing. This guy is really doing this. He takes this step. But as he takes the step, you also then realize that his step is kind of just filled with, with assumptions. It's, it's filled with expectations. He's not coming as one who's submitting himself, expecting Jesus um, to be Jesus to him. He's coming uh, from a position of expectation of this is what Jesus is going to do for me. And so he has flaws. Amazingly, though, even in his flaws, he gets loved by Jesus. He gets loved in the process. And I think this is what happens also with us. I think when we come to Christ, we come imperfect. We come full of flaws. We come full of expectation. But Jesus doesn't reject us. Jesus accepts us and deals with both our need and our need to be educated and our need to, be, to grow as we come to him and how we come to him. What's amazing is that Jesus responds to him. Jesus reaches out to him. Jesus cares for him. This is what you and I always face when we come face to face with Christ. None of us are too far that we can be reached. None of us are too far that we can be loved. None of us are too far that we can be um, taught and grow in our love and in our relationship with Christ. As we see how this story unfolds, as we see how this official interacts with Jesus and how Jesus interacts with this official, my question to you is, what do you think needs to happen in your life as you relate to Jesus and as you engage with Jesus. Interesting that although this official shows so much faith, which I mentioned earlier, he takes almost one step forward, but then it feels like in the story, and as the story um, unfolds, he takes two steps backward. He takes one step forward, um, and and, and here's what we see. He leaves his son um, on his bed where he's ill, about to die. But then he gets to Jesus, and he orders Jesus around, two steps back. Hang on, wait. Who do you think you're talking to here? Who do you think you're engaging with here? He takes one step forward. He overcomes his pride. He overcomes uh, his arrogance. He overcomes his a uh, kind of stage where he operates, where he's the boss, and he comes out into the street, asks help from a carpenter, homeless guy, then takes two steps back. Like, I'm asking you for help, and I want you to understand that I know how you can help me. So why don't you just do that? Why don't you come with me to my house and do what I'm asking you to do. And so we see that there's sometimes lack of understanding here of who this man is and who Jesus is. I think I do that a lot. I come to Jesus and I say, "Um, Jesus, I need this, this, and this. And I'm going to walk you. I'm going to give you a step-by-step guide um, on how to achieve these things. But actually, I don't think that that's how it's supposed to be. Because at the end of the day, Jesus is the one who is 
Lord. He is the one who reigns supreme. He's the one who rules over all. He's the one who is sovereign. And so I come to him knowing that he loves me and he knows what's good for me. And what I ask of him, he knows the best and ultimate outcome for. So he will guide me to it in the best possible way. Jesus is not to be seen as a miracle worker who should take orders, a genie in a bottle or a slot machine or, uh, you know, a vending machine where you put in a coin and you uh, get something out. Jesus is being revealed as one who heals um, in this story. He's revealed as one who restores the story, one who can speak a word into a, a situation that is terrifying, that is overwhelming, that is burdening, and, and we see it resolved because of his word. Jesus is loving, he uh, is teaching, and he's reaching out to those who are near and those who have a misunderstanding of who he is. And so, how are we then to respond in understanding who Jesus is, in understanding who this official is, in understanding how this official relates to Jesus and how Jesus responds to him? How are we to respond in our relationship with Jesus? When looking at Jesus and who he is, what he can do and what he has come for on earth, it can be very easy to treat him and to treat, to treat our relationship with him like a transaction. Jesus, you can do this. You're able to do this. You've come to do this. So I expect you to do this. Almost like an insurance company. You do what you want, how you want to do it when you want to do it, but then you get a safety net where if the things that you've done, how you want to do them, when you want to do them, go wrong, you can kind of just dial, you know, pick up your phone, dial direct or outsurance, press one for the Jesus department, and he'll take care of everything. Jesus is not just giving us Stuff Jesus is not just giving to us, he's also asking of us. And what Jesus is asking from us, the first thing I'd like to point out is he's asking of us faith. Jesus is asking of us faith. Let's look at what God is doing among us, not just what Jesus can do for us, and let's have faith that Christ really can do that. Jesus is asking obedience. Interestingly, a couple of weeks ago, I saw something on my phone that said, God, I don't know when my prayer will be delivered, but can you please just provide me with a tracking number? I don't think that's how that works. I think how it works is that we're to trust that Jesus knows the best outcome in love for us and for his own glory, and he'll bring that to be. So he's asking us to obey him. Number three is he's asking us to trust him. He's asking us to trust him. Now, here's the deal with that. Is that you, you can almost imagine as this man is walking away. Think about this. This guy has overcome all of these things. He gets to this place where he has needed to kind of bend himself into shape, ask Jesus for help. He is among crowds and he asks Jesus, Jesus, I need your help. And Jesus' response, Jesus' response is, just go, your son will be well. 
I- imagine him walking away thinking, really, that was it? That's all there is? Like, there's no anointing oil, there's no water, there's no candles, there's no prayer mat. That's all just... You must be kidding. It's like going to the doctor. You've got pain, and you go to the doctor. When you get to the doctor, um, the doctor kind of assesses you, looks at you, and says, just go home and drink water. It feels a little bit out of place, doesn't it? But Jesus knows best. Jesus knows best, and he's asking us to trust him. Trusting Christ isn't always easy and may not always be easy. In this instance, um, it clearly is not easy. But it says the man believed what Jesus said. Jesus says to him, I'm not coming to your house. I'm not meeting this expectation that you have of me. I'm not coming. Go, your son will be well. Jesus um, says, you know, I'm not going to do what you expect or what you want me to do, but your son will be well. I can't tell you how often, how many times I've looked at a situation and thought, this is not going at all the way I'm expecting it to. It's not going at all the way I want it to or the way that I would like it to. But we get to the end of that situation and I think, well, the outcome is just so much better. And the reason for that is, at the end of the day, Jesus just knows better than I do. And he works things out better than I ever could. So I am called to trust him, submit to him, and look to him as Lord, and see him be the one who leads the way, not try to be the one who submitted to him, and yet I'm trying to kind of lead the charge. So then, as we come to land, I'm going to ask you, three or four possible things. Having seen how Jesus relates, having seen how this man comes to Jesus, and I've asked you to think about yourself and how you come to Jesus, sometimes with expectations, sometimes with underlying contracts, what you want Jesus to do for you, what you think he expects you to do for him. The question is, will you trust him? Will you trust him as this man did, even though he came with expectations when Jesus said, your son will be well, says he took on the word he believed. Will you trust him? Will you obey him? There's something there of, this guy could have pushed into the crowd, he could have insisted, he could have, persisted that, hey, I've got power, I've got influence, what would you want me to do for you? You know, if you're in Joburg, maybe, can I buy you a cool drink? You might know what that means. But will you trust Jesus? Will you have faith in him? It says of this man that he's him and his whole family If his son was old enough, he would have also believed. Jesus has done something significant in this man's life that he has decided to follow him with all that he has. To have faith in him, to submit himself, to see him as Lord. Will you have faith in Christ? And lastly, If you don't follow him, will you follow him? Will you follow him? Will you let go of your assumptions? Will you let go of your expectations? Will you let go of whatever things that you think Jesus should do for you and just come to him as you are and allow him to receive you from where you are to love you, to teach you, and to reach out to you? do that. This morning, um, there's an opportunity that you can email us, that you can um, be in contact with us, and we would love for you um, to do that so that we can follow up with you. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to
uh, bring this message to a close. You also then get to know, um, after we close, some notices of what's going on um, and what's going to be happening in the life of our church in the coming weeks. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in us, what you're doing among us. Jesus, we thank you that you don't reject us when we have different expectations of what should happen. Rather, you correct us and you bring us onto the right path. We pray this morning that you would help us, that you would strengthen us, that you would shape us in accordance to your will and to your glory. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts and hearts.